get started. Um, thanks for coming out tonight to the Whalen Library. Um, just for your information, Wacam is filming this, so you might see the back of your head on TV, but you can also watch it on Wacam or on YouTube later. Um, we're excited tonight to welcome John Root and Jim Zembrowski of the Aldrich Astronomical Society to teach us about scanning the November skies and how to use our new library telescope. The purchase of this telescope an anonymous donor to whom we are very grateful in honor of Meg, a science teacher. The Aldrich Astronomical Society has customized it for our use and will help us to maintain it. The telescope as a week, if not later this week. So thank you again for coming and please enjoy. Where's the lapel one? here in Massachusetts. And that being the case, Jim had actually gone up to a meeting at the McAuliffe Shepard Discovery Center up in Concord, New Hampshire. That's where he met a number of folks that were members of New Hampshire Astro who were telling him about this program. Of course, we'd not heard about it down here in Massachusetts because they were primarily working up in New Hampshire. So when Jim came back to one of our meetings, and we meet, by the way, at Anna Maria College in Paxton, he didn't talk five minutes when I recognized the value of the program and put my hand up. I said, Jim, I said, put me down for buying one for the Paxton Riches Memorial Library, which I did. I bought and donated it in memory of my wife. He, at the same time, bought one for the Beals Library up in Winchenden, where he lives, and that was in memory of his mom and dad. After a week of, af about a week after I had made the announcement to the library in Paxton that I was doing this, I had a call from one of the folks here at the library, one of the librarians said, John, is it all right if we put an announcement about this on a blog site called Mass Yak? You know, like yak, yak, yak. I said, sure, we want to get the word out. They did, and no lie, within a week to 10 days, I had 14 hot inquiries. And it wasn't a matter of, can you tell us more about what this is all about? How does it work? It was, when can we get ours? So immediately, eight of those libraries jumped on board. And as a result, well, carrying this a little further, my name again is John Root. I'm the program coordinator for the whole state. Jim is the current president of Aldrich, but he's also a solar system ambassador under NASA KPL. And... This is the picture that I was starting to refer to. I call them my gang of eight. These are all members of Aldrich who modified the telescopes before they were ready to go out to a library. That first group of eight went to Royalston, Hubbardston, Rutland, Spencer, Sutton, Shrewsbury, Milford, and Beverly, way up on the North Shore. So we got kind of spread around right from the get-go. Now, over the last five and a half years, we have managed to put 179 telescopes into 163 different libraries, including two in Vermont and three in Connecticut. But primarily, they're all in Mass, including one on Nantucket and one on Martha's Vineyard. So we took ferry rides out there for that one. Now, uh-oh, donation. We had a blank slide in there, Jim. I didn't know about that. Like Courtney said, this is made by an anonymous donor in memory of Meg, who evidently was a stellar science teaching teacher. Now, bringing it all into focus, who says we don't have a sense of humor? We modify these telescopes heavily. You can go on Orion's website and buy that telescope that's over on the table, bare bones, for about $220 but it's not what's sitting there right now. 
we do a number of things to make the telescope a little bit more durable and also user friendly. In the five and a half years that we've been putting these telescopes here in Massachusetts, I can count on two hands the number of times I've had to go to a library and fix something. Nothing major either. So again, it's been a sturdy little workhorse. One of the things that we do is change the eyepiece. Now originally when you buy the telescope from Orion, it comes with two separate individual eyepieces. And even early, very early in the program, and they, by the way, started theirs. They put their first two in place in November of 2008. They now have 125 in place, last I knew. But by mid-2009, they had reports coming back from a director or a designate in the library saying a patron had brought the telescope back in and admitted that when they were changing from one eyepiece to the other, they dropped one on the ground. Not good. Potential damage, but even dirt. So New Hampshire's cure was to go with a variable power zoom eyepiece. It's like a telephoto lens on your camera. You don't have to change it unless you're going to a higher power. But at any rate, that eliminated the need to change eyepieces. Then we attach the eyepiece cap and also the aperture cover with cords so the caps don't get lost in the grass in the backyard or some field where you happen to go to set up and observe. Neat in that regard. The only electric thing on the whole telescope is a battery-powered easy finder, as it's called. This is your locating device. Now, originally, up underneath the front cover, there was a CR2032 button battery. Very expensive. I mean, you're looking five or six bucks a piece, and they don't last. So New Hampshire Astronomical went and got a little black plastic box from the Radio Shack local. Good luck finding a Radio Shack today, unfortunately. It holds two AA batteries, and we wire it in to replace that button battery. That button battery might last two hours if it's left on during a viewing session. These will go 30, 35 hours, no problem at all, and very easily changed. And what you see when you look through the peep sight is the red dot. Now, this is a red projected LED dot. It is not a laser, so there's no potential damage to your eyes. You can't. The whole way you're using this telescope is to move the telescope around, swiveling it on the base, moving the optical tube assembly up and down, putting that red dot on whatever it is you want to observe, whether it's the moon, Saturn, Mars, whatever. So like I say, it's a very, very easy telescope to use. Four and a half inch mirror. It's a reflector telescope. Very capable. At the fi at, well, 56 power setting of observing the rings around Saturn. So it's got some power, believe me. And the tote underneath the table there. That's how you're going to get the telescope from the library to your home, back and forth again, safely and securely. The key thing to remember is when you put the telescope in the tote, the eyepiece and the easy finder are pointing up. Not to one side or the other, or heaven forbid, down. Because it will knock that easy finder. And even though you put a red dot on something you want to look at, when you look through the eyepiece, it's not there. <laughs> so that's the only thing you got to be really careful about is handling. Putting it all together. In the pouch that's attached to the upright part of the scope base. A couple of books. One is National Audubon's Pocket Guide to Constellations, Northern Hemisphere. The other, the most important one, is the instruction manual. Now, the kids love this because there's also a red and white light headlight. We do programs for scout groups. We pass out a lot of these, and the kids have got them on, and they've got the white light on, and they're running around the yard or the field, wherever we are, and they look like fireflies flitting around. So at any rate, that's the thing to do is to use it. It's a white light and a red light. 
the red light does not mess up your jar adaption. Adults, it's going to take us 10 to 15 minutes or more when we go out into a dark sky situation for our eyes to get dark adapted. Pupils are going to open up just a little bit more from our normal eh, four, four and a half inch millimeter pupil. Kids are lucky. They've got eight millimeter, so right away they've got twice the size eyeballs that we do. <laughs> but at any rate, the red light does not mess up your dark adaption. And why do you suppose they have red brake, brake lights on cars? Can you imagine if they were white like the headlights? And the glare you'd be getting? At any rate, how many own binoculars? Probably everybody in the room. What a wonderful way to search the night sky for things to look for. Plus the fact you're using two eyes. So look through your binoculars. If you see something very interesting, that's when you point the telescope at it to see what it is. And we'll get, Jim will get into more about how to look for things after that. Now, you really don't have to make any adjustments to the telescope other than twisting the eyepiece to get the power that you want and moving the telescope around, swiveling it on the base or moving the tube up and down. What to do? Look at the instruction manual. And by the way, I didn't mention this until now. You see there are two images of stop signs? Because that's a reflector telescope. The image you see when you look through the eyepiece is going to be flipped and reversed. That's the way they work. Sorry. If it were a refractor type telescope, like the old Pirate Spyglass, that's going to give you an upright image. But a reflector will always be upside down and flipped. Handle it with care. Again, I mentioned that before. It's a precision piece of optical equipment. Then, never, ever, ever look at the sun. Don't even point the telescope at the sun because there's enough heat generated where it could soften the adhesive holding the secondary mirror on its gimbal mount and it might shift or even fall off. And to look through it, other than the fact immediately you, you know you've looked at something very bright, but instantly and also irreversible damage to your eye. You have burned a hole in your retina and there's no repair for that. So don't look at the sun, believe me. Don't touch any optical surface with your fingers. Well, the only one you can really get close to is the eyepiece. If it looks dusty, don't worry about it. It's got to be caked in mud before it's going to affect what you're able to see. The library has been trained. They have a special tool for cleaning it. But don't you, heaven forbid, take a paper towel or a tissue soaked in Windex and try to clean it off because that Windex chemical will remove the optical coating on the eyepiece. And you don't want to go there. Okay. Obviously, the darker sky sight that you can find, whether it's in your backyard, getting away from house lights, street lights, security lights, headlights, the whole bit. Whether it's in your backyard or out in the field someplace that you can go with a park. The more of a dark sky sight you can find, the more things you're going to be able to see. Simple as that. And looking at the moon, well, Jim will explain about that. I won't go there. And actually, that's why I'm going to turn it over to Jim now, because he'll talk about magnification and a few other things in that regard. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Um, so how powerful is the telescope? And I always say 150 millimeter. Or I have bring a bigger telescope sometimes, 250 millimeter. Or the 114 millimeter telescope right there. And they're all going, how many X's is that? You know, the X factor. 
right around the holiday, we get a lot of misleading advertising where they tell you, hey, $199.99. You can't stay home. You've got to go out and purchase that telescope because it is so great. 599X. Guess what? Are they pulling your leg? Well, let me explain it to you a little. I'm going to be a little smarter after I explain it. What they're giving you is a two inch diameter plastic lens. They're giving you three eyepieces to maximize the magnification range. Did I say made out of cheap plastic? And then they give you a tripler, cheap plastic. So, in fact, due to the laws of physics in our universe, 599X is what you should get. Realistically, two inch, 40X max with a good quality lens and you're dealing with cheap plastic. So you really, people are coming to me and say, I can't focus, I can't see anything, everything looks fuzzy to me, and I congratulate them, shake their hands heartily, and say, thank God you got good eyesight. <laughs> you can't make that telescope work. This is the advantage of all the trouble has been worked on for you. So that telescope is ready to go, it's got the correct range of magnification you need, and it's got a perfect size aperture to gather sufficient light yourself in the night sky and I'm going to show you what you're going to do with that. So magnification, not the most important aspect of telescope ownership, but we, we uh, kind of advise you on it. And aperture is the most important part. So I get myself pretty cozy. This is early in the summer, obviously not tonight. Okay, I'd have my polar fleece on and the dog would probably get his little polar fleece uh, overcoat on. But you have to always deal with your eye, John pointed out. Your pupil has got to be dark adapted. Your telescope, don't forget this, has got to be adapted to the outside. It's called acclimation. So taking a telescope and putting it in the back seat of the car in the middle of summertime and in the back seat of the car heats up to 120 degrees, guess what? You're not going to be deserving of that telescope until it cools down and acclimates to whatever the outdoor temperature is. Likewise in winter, Comfy, cozy, watching your TV, running out to see Saturn with the library telescope. Well, make sure the telescope's out there ahead of time and dress appropriately and go out there. And now both of you, we got to acclimate. Once you do that, you're going to have a really good experience. And plus atmosphere. There's nothing, New England is the way it is. So we're going to have to deal with atmosphere a lot. And we knew a lot about atmosphere last night because everyone on our group was trying to go out to see a transit of free at our observatory and, of course, overcast sky. But this is what you're going to see right here. 50x magnification, you're going to see the upper uh, cloud belts of Jupiter. Jupiter, by the way, there's a healthy competition going on between Jupiter and Saturn. And uh, Jupiter had 79 moons, 12 new moons were recently discovered. And everyone was cheering in the Jupiter, you know, front. Uh, they just released some information about Saturn, 83 moons, or 82 moons, excuse me. So we do have a chart on the side of the telescope. Basically, there's your range of magnification that's useful for this telescope. And then, of course, like I said, get your pupil dark adapted. And telescope etiquette. A lot of places, in a lot of areas, you have uh, various astronomy clubs. Local, uh, local universities have astronomy clubs. They go out, come on, take a look through our telescope. Uh, telescope etiquette always asks for directions. A lot of these telescopes are high end. And we, meaning they track and compensate for the Earth's rotation. So always make sure you know how to handle yourself. First thing you'd ever do is don't ever touch the telescope. Just lower your eye. And usually what I try to do is put a, a ladder outside for the that can't reach the eyepiece. But the other thing, I put a, like a U-form loop on the ladder, right? Why? Because even if I'm a little older, I hang on to that instead of grabbing the telescope. I hang on to that to steady my uh, hand and basically look through the eyepiece and lower myself. And it makes it just a lot more comfortable. The thing is, you don't want to struggle to be able to look through a telescope and see an object in the night sky. And every one of these telescopes is a really good high-end, high-quality telescope, but it may not, in fact, work for everyone in this room. Each of these telescopes is basically uh, produced with a certain type of viewing in mind. And here's the closest one we can get to the library telescope. This is a little larger version of that one from Orion, it's a six inch version. And then back here at astronomy, I'm going to prove to you that fact aperture is where it's at. Now when you go up to the night sky, most of my students will say, oh, Mr. Sprowski, there's Ursa Major. And I'm going, no, that's the asterism of the Big Dipper. 
Ursa Major, or the Big Bear, is the constellation. The, the Big Dipper and Little Dipper are asterisks and small portions that represent geometrical objects in the constellation. But take a good close look at that. That's a good view of the uh, Big Dipper. Notice there's a little bit of a knob on that, second star in the handle. Take a close look at it through binoculars. Yep, Alcorn Miser, a beautiful double star, which is easily resolved by this telescope or to the human eye if you have really dark areas. And you go out and look at that. Alcor is the dim one, Miser is the brighter one. Everyone says, okay, historically it's been well documented. The Native Americans call it the squaw and the papoose. The uh, Arabs used to call it the horse and rider. So historically it was well known. Well now I want you to point the library telescope on it and see what you see. And everyone says the same thing. Wow, Mr. Zabrowski, that library telescope is so amazing because Alcar and Miser are just so bright and they're still touching and they're doing amazing things in this eyepiece. And I go, Miser, Alcor. Uh-oh, curveball, right? Imagine now, rather than an eight millimeter pupil, or in my case, a four millimeter pupil, you now have a 114 millimeter pupil, the size of the aperture of your library telescope. You would look at the night sky and clearly see, Mr. Zabrowski, Miser is a double star. So that's Miser A, Miser B, and if Hubble puts its eyes on it, Miser A becomes a double, Miser B becomes a double, and guess what? Alcor is a double. And that little black disk in the middle, that blocks the intense light of Alcor, which seems very dim, but when you really go in and look at it with Hubble, you need to block the light so you can now pick up the dimmer light of its companion star. So it's a double, double, double star. It's quite amazing. The power of the telescope, light gathering, and ability to resolve closely spaced objects. November skies, oh, I tell you, November skies can knock your eyeballs out. Really amazing here. Go out in the early evening. This is what you're going to see. I, and everyone notice this? The bear has legs and a nose, and only a small portion of this is the dipper itself. So it is a large constellation here. And you also want to know, there's your pointer in the Big Dipper, the bowl of the Big Dipper, and you go toward Polaris, and you keep going this way, you eventually hit Cassiopeia, Queen Cassiopeia in the night sky. And we're going to introduce you to something called star hopping. So it's the equivalent of me saying, oh, go to the local library, Behind the library is the parking lot. To the left of the library is the police station. To the right of the li library is the Cumberland Farms. So I'm giving you directions via the library. I'm not telling you how to get to each of those locations. So the great library in the sky is the Big Dipper asterism or the constellation of Ursa Major. It's going to show you where other things are in the night sky. And in deep winter, Orion, the hunter, is another good uh, pointer to find objects in the night sky. And by the way, Earth and sky, astronomy, sky and telescope, put that in and they'll, you'll download charts of what you can see every night of the week. Every single day they'll tell you something different is going to be up there. Now look at this. If you go out like that, you basically can find multiple double galaxy set, which is a spiral edge on galaxy M81 and M82. Uh, that is what they used to call in a regular galaxy. Now it's a line of sight. It's a spiral that we can only see at John, so we don't get the true sense of it being spiral. But that's astrophotographer Charlie uh, Stevenson's image there. And then you go out and you can see the beautiful circumpolar sky here with Draco, Cepheus, Queen Cassiopeia, uh, um, basically Ursa Minor, and then Ursa uh, Major, the constellation. And once again, people come to me. You are pulling our leg. I went home. I can't see Ursa Major. I said, do you have tall trees in your yard? Yep. I didn't see they would be above the tree line. I said they would be above your horizon for your latitude. They're, that's what they call circumpolar. They never set at this latitude. But that doesn't mean you, can't, you can see them easily because you may have blockages. We call trees and... Uh, buildings and everything like that. So you've got to be very careful about that and talking to people about that. And Cassiopeia, you see that Cassiopeia A? This here is produced by our own local 
a deep sky observatory, which is controlled with the Mission Control Center out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's called Chandra. It's a deep space X-ray telescope, and this has powerful uh, energy, multiple wavelengths with Hubble and X-rays, uh, which from Chandra, and then basically infrared for Spitzer, and you produce this multi-wavelength image of this supernova remnant from a star that burst many thousands of years ago, basically, and ended its life and produced beautiful organic kind of form as it's migrating outward from the center of the explosion. And you can see the star, the remnant of the star, uh, isolated white dwarf core, or a neutron star, or maybe a black hole. Depends on the mass of the star. And then you have beautiful Queen Cassiopeia. And I highly recommend getting on the internet, find out anything by Akira Fuji. Fuji. He's a really outstanding astrophotographer, and he does these really nice broad images of constellations in the night sky, which makes it easy to find objects in the night sky. And you can see Queen, you hear the W here. By the way, if you look at it the right way, it's an M. Or you can look at it this way, that's a kite with a celestial kite string or tail there. And by the way, do you see a little patch of light there? The beautiful double cluster in Perseus. Look at that. Fred Espinac puts this out through his uh, website, which is astropixels.com. Beautiful double cluster. Clusters are located very close by. And you've got to watch astronomers. When they say close by, they don't mean close by. They mean 7,600 light years away for the first one and 6,800 light years away. And when they say young, this is a baby, 5.6 million years old. And this is a younger baby at 3.2 million years. So stars have long lives. Some stars have very short lives. So in terms, even the shortest lived stars, are, we're talking in terms of millions of years. So it's really quite amazing. So I always tell people, watch the colors of what you're looking at. They're not always true colors. Always watch out distances and watch out basically for how old objects are. Now, if I go to this fourth star in the W of Cassiopeia and I draw a line right directly down, I find a faint patch of light, and that's the great galaxy in Andromeda. Personally, I do it this way. I find the great square in Pegasus, which is a four very dim stars. But I'll tell you, you get a really dark sky, you go out there, it looks like a giant square in the sky. It really does. It jumps out at you. And you get the corner star in the square. You go out one, you go out one, and you're going to Andromeda. You jog up one, jog up another one, and jog up, and you find the faint patch of light that way, and there is your great galaxy in Andromeda that way. And by the way, before you jog up there, this is called Gamma Andromeda, and that's a beautiful powder blue and golden yellow star, a, go, uh, a good binary star, really good close uh, uh, orbiting around each other's center of mass, basically. Really quite amazing to see that through a telescope. And I love Ken Cleveland. Ken Cleveland on our cloud took this wide field view of the Andromeda galaxy, and you can see the two satellite galaxies there. You can see it's definitely a spiral galaxy, similar in nature to the Milky Way, 750 billion suns, very similar in size. But it gives you a true perspective. And of course, we have Kevin Boucher, who goes in a little closer, more detail. You can see the separation now for two satellite galaxies and uh, really quite spectacular. You're not going to see them quite this good. Astrophotography always brings out the detail. But I'll tell you, the human eye is very forgiving. The human eye will see things if you pay attention and you know what you're looking at. And half the fun of uh, astronomy is reading something up about it, pointing at an object in the night sky, and then finding out that you can find it and understanding it, right? If you look up in the night sky coming home from a hard day at work or a hard day at school and you say, Wow, those stars, you feel like you can almost reach out and grab them. Or you can go, being an amateur astronomer, and go, wow, Betelgeuse is amazing. Did you see Rigel? Taurus, the bull over there. Really? Well, you now own your piece of the universe because you are naming the stars. Name the stars, you own your universe. And this is the advantage of getting into an amateur astronomy. It's a lot of fun. So the great Pegasus, and I used to do this when my father goes to went to work in Syracuse, New York, where I grew up, and he'd be going to work like six o'clock in the morning. I'd be just packing things away, and I'd see this lonely, lonely star, nothing else in that section of the sky, and it's called Formal Hall. 
and that was in Syracuse, New York. You just barely see it it's, uh, from the uh, southern fishes, as you can see here. Little did I know, multiple years later, I'm sitting here in front of you going, I never appreciated how amazing that star was. Why? Hubble takes an image of it. Once again, the coronagraph blocking the light of the main star from Holtz. Picks planet in an asteroid belt around a distant star from Holtz. Amazing. We not only have the ability to resolve planets through the transiting method, which is blocking a portion of light of the star as it passes in front of it, we now can actually see, by some circumstances, some actual orbiting planets around nearby stars. Really quite amazing. And then, of course, everyone has fun with the summer triangle. Deneb, meaning tail feathers in um, Arabic. And then we got Vega, a bright star 26 light years away in the constellation of Lyra. And you got Altair in Aquila, which is 14 and a half light years away. Deneb is 1,600 light years away. So when you go out there, and you look at that, and if I tell you you put Deneb at the distance of Altair, you would need a light to read the maps to see what you're looking at in the night sky. It would be very bright in the night sky with that star. That's how bright it is, 70,000 times the luminosity of our sun. And this was put out by Susan Jensen, and I think this is, a, yeah, I think this is on Earth and Sky. And she does a really good job of drawing in all the uh, uh, diagrams here for the summer triangle. But take a good close look at the head of the swan, El Zuriga. Gorgeous through this telescope. Aim that telescope on it, look what you're going to see. Powder blue and golden yellow. Really amazing. And that's the secret of Alberio. Color. Most people will not figure it out. Stars have color, and that color represents the different temperatures of different stars. Unbelievable. Blue being a more higher temperature. Uh, it the star with the golden yellow color here. And this is the uh, Capella Observatory. That star is about 380 light years away. So this is really a nice image I was able to find on the internet to kind of illustrate that. And then we have an image by Bruce Card from our astrophotography group. And you can see this. This is called a M57 or the Ring Nebula. And all that is is a star like our sun. And kids always ask me this, when's our star going to blow up? Never. And it, it's never going to happen. Our star is too small to go supernova. So what it does, it goes into what is known as a red giant phase, where it puffs itself out and then collapses, leaving the outer part of its atmosphere unattended. And it kind of just moves out, forms this beautiful ring. And I used to refer to it as a puff cigar smoke until kids at the Equalitarium where I did a program there corrected me. Mr. Zabrowski, that's not cigar smoke. That's a Cheerio. So we have the Cheerio in the night sky. Enjoy. That's the outer atmosphere of a star that has mass like our sun. And if you get enough of a re resolved image, not through this telescope, but maybe through a 12-inch telescope, you can actually see the central star, which is causing that outer atmosphere to be illuminated. And then, of course, we have meteor showers all through the winter. Uh, this one is... Well, full moon, you, you, it's going to be very difficult to see any of the dimmer meteors. Uh, there's maybe about 10 to 12 an hour. It's going to be very difficult. And this is usually the best morning hours in Taurus. So I always say, look, look around for the Pleiades and just to ride around the area of the Pleiades, you'll see the meteors coming out. And you don't need anything but that. By the way, I want to warn everyone when you go out, and you want, to, you want to print these charts out to show what you're going to be looking at after you borrow the library telescope, you'll have either a green uh, a line or you'll have a red line. That is called the ecliptic, the line of the solar system, the center line of the solar system. So all the planets are aligned on that. So people are always telling me, uh, I can't find planets to save my life. I go, oh, can you find the moon? And most people say, yes, great, because left of the moon, right of the moon, east of the moon, West of the moon, bright object, guess what? Planet. Why? Because the moon is also very close to that ecliptic. So it makes it easy to find objects in the night sky that way. And then, of course, we got Jupiter heading for the horizon. It's gone as of right now. And then we have Venus, which is now coming into the forefront. And Saturn is setting probably in the next five or ten minutes. So that's going away. Uh, 
But uh, you can still see it, so do take the library telescope. Saturn is always a revelation. And there's Jupiter. Fran Edwards from our club took a picture of Jupiter. You can clearly see the red spot. And yes, you can see the red spot through a telescope. But you'll mostly see the upper gas belts in the upper part of the atmosphere. Really quite amazing. And that's a gas giant along with Saturn. And here's Ed Lamelli from Sacramento, California. And this is spaceweather.com, another great place to go on the internet to look at what's happening in my space environment. And he posted that one. And I think that's awesome. And then early in the morning, my favorite, the other choice I have for hopping around the night sky is Orion the Hunter. And you have the three stars in Orion's belt. And everyone tells me, hey, Mr. Sabrowski, winter is really the best time of the year to look. If I have to buy a telescope, you want to buy it in the winter, right? Because there's no good stars in the summertime. I go, mm, not really. There's a lot of good stars in the summertime. Boy, I remember it being so bright in the winter. Well, here's the story. A, winter is cold, which means... B, very low humidity, which causes distortions in the atmosphere. And the other part of it is, basically, is that the area that you're looking at right here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then over here, you've got a couple other stars. And above it, you've got a couple other stars. There's a dozen stars in that one area of the sky that's going to grab your attention because they're the brightest stars in the heavens. Summer or winter, they're bright, so they're noticeable. So it's just by circumstance in the wintertime, people tend to see them pop a little bit better. I've seen really good viewing conditions in the summertime. But I will, I, I will admit to everyone in the audience, it's nice not to swat the mosquitoes, which have been very devastating this year. In the wintertime, you can avoid that. Take a look at this. This is Bruce Carr's view of 42, which is a stellar nursery. So there's enough mass of gas in this area of space to form tens of thousands of brand new baby stars. So that's what they call it, a stellar nursery. And that's all powered by really intense light coming out from the trapezium, which is a grouping of 11 different stars, four of which you can clearly see through your telescope right here. And you'll see that. And it really looks ethereal and ghost-like. Amazing through a small telescope or through binoculars. By the way, read up, Sky and Telescope, locally published out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Really breaking news here with the shadow of the uh, silhouette of the uh, black hole. And then we have Astronomy, which is another magazine I highly recommend. So between those and Go Online, Earth and Sky, or Go Online, both of these have online presence. And they'll basically keep you updated. So you don't have to guess of what's available in the night sky. Or is this a good week? Or is next week a good week? Eh, take it out. As long as it's clear to me, it's a good week. you know. And then we have waning a gibbous moon. So this is getting more toward new moon. This is Penn Cleveland. We always advise people up to first quarter, maybe a little bit more, and then from this segment of the moon phase, which is a, a waning gibbous all the way down to new moon, you'll find that nice line of light and dark there. See that? The contrast is really amazing. You'll see mountain peaks in the craters. So you want a little bit more contrast. Full moon, it's tonight, full moon is so bright it just washes right out. You can hardly see anything. Spaceweather.com. Did I mention it just recently? Yeah. And it's it, it's solar minimum. I, I like to brag about sunspots. Sunspots are magnetic disturbances on the surface of the sun. They're like the size of Jupiter, which is about like 10 Earth sizes in diameter. So they're really a major presence in the sky. Nothing. We've gone through like 232 days so far this year without a single sunspot. So it's a solar minimum. But guess what? Uh-oh, something's sneaking in. And there's the Solar Dynamics Observatory taking a picture, and that's Mercury. Every now and then, Mercury, along the line of the ecliptic, lines up exactly where the Earth is looking out, and it crosses across the disk of the sun. And it's called a transit, just like we find exoplanets. This is what we find here. And it decreases the light from the sun, not by much, but you can see the dark disk of Mercury. And it's our inner planet. And that, the next one is 2049. So we were really upset when we got clouded over the other day. But other people took some uh, driving. Corey Mooney, who was stopped by our club on occasion, he went to Gooseberry Island in Westfield, and he was able to get it and kind of see it there, that little tiny dense. I mean, Mercury's very tiny. Mercury is smaller than three of the moons in the solar system. So that's how tiny a planet is. And then, of course, we have the beautiful 
SDO image, which is an image of the electromagnetic field activity of the sun. And you can see these big, huge gaps here. And those gaps are facing Earth. And people used to always scratch their head. It's solar minimum. There's no sunspots. How do we get these beautiful northern lights happening? Well, that's because there's a breakdown of the electromagnetic field lines here. And the solar wind is able to break free. And if the Earth's in its way, guess what? Hits both poles of the Earth, and you get the beautiful, beautiful aurora borealis. That's gorgeous. Chris Hudson basically took this on November 9th in Sweden, where you can see it near the aurora oval. Really kind of amazing. I've seen about 45 auroras from this state alone. So when you have peak solar year, it's very easy to see it from Massachusetts. And then, of course, we're also celebrating, after celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first landing of the moon, we have the 50th anniversary on November 14th of Apollo 12, the precision landing voyage to the moon. Really kind of amazing. And you can see Commander Pete Conrad. He had to land right exactly to take a short casual walk down to the Surveyor, which was a robotic spacecraft that landed there three years earlier. And he was able to walk over. They, they were cheering and yelling and screaming. And, hey, man, there it is. Get outside the window. Put it right down here. So they had a precision put down within 300 feet of Surveyor, whereas Neil and Buzz basically mm, four and a half, five miles off target for good reasons. That was the learning still. We got more and more precise. And you can see the lander in the background there. And of course, I love these pictures where you get the picture of the reflection of your partner off the gold foil visor there. And this is Alan Bean, who is a great painter in his own right after he retired from NASA. And you can see his uh, companion there, red reflected in his gold visor. And yes, you can see the flags, but only from moon orbit. So you can see all the flags. You can see all the equipment left behind. You can see all the footprints of the astronaut. There's the bottom stage, a little bit enlarged here, all the bottom stages of, the, of where they visited. You can see where the surveyor, they bought a piece of surveyor back. So all this you can see online. And Apollo 11 and Apollo 14, for whatever reason, are the only missions where you can't see the flag. There doesn't seem to be any flag left. All the others, you can fly over multiple times with something called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and you'll see the shadow moving meaning the flag still upright, which is amazing, considering it was a $5 purchase by NASA. $5 flags don't leave, last very long on the moon. <sighs> John and I, every time we hear this from SpaceX, they're only tiny. They're the size of a bread box. But there's 600 of them. Or there's going to be 12,000 of them. Yay for people who don't have the internet. Not so great for people who want to enjoy dark skies and astronomy and for professional astronomers because they're very concerned about these reflectors getting a glint of sunlight here. And what happened? You got a trail, it looks like a sky train across the whole thing of these like little dim objects in the night sky, and they're everywhere. They're, they're, they're dispersing themselves all across the night sky. And when you're going deep sky, the worst thing you could have is to have a jet trail or a contrail or a satellite go through your field of view. And now you've got dozens of these while putting them up. So I don't know. There's, it's, it, there's a lot of benefits, but there's a mixed feeling on my part. And here is Sonny Williams right here and Josh Casada. They are designated to be one of the first to go landing on the moon for Artemis. The first one who will put her boots on the surface of the moon will be a woman. Okay, so they get their full just due there because they've been working hard to make this happen. And this is through Boeing Starliner. And they're going to be participating, hopefully, on the short list of people who might go to the moon. And here's the special Boeing. Uh, and that was made by David Clark Company here locally out of Worcester, Massachusetts. And here's their uh, ascent and landing spacesuits where they sit in the capsule. And, and this is what the space capsule looks like. You can have up to seven astronauts inside, so it's pretty spacious. It does look like an Apollo capsule, but Apollo capsule was like a Volkswagen bug. You know, Now this is like twice the size of a Volkswagen bug, so it's a little bit more roomy, a little bit more elbow room without punching your uh, co colleague in the face. And this is what they're going to use for a rocket. And they were very successful in testing the escape system on the rocket. 
uh, and they try this out. So the, it may be as soon as December. So keep an eye on the information on the internet and the newspapers. They'll tell you when this is going to be launched. It'll be on man, but this will finally get U.S. astronauts in a U.S. space capsule launched from U.S. soil into orbit going to our own space station. So we're back in the game again. John and I highly recommend this. What's up for November? What's up for December? What's up for January? Okay? Don't do what I did, naive person that I am. What's up? And then you start downloading 50 or 60 rap songs. What's up? Okay. Put in NASA, what's up for November? NASA, what's up for December? And it gives you two minutes and 30 seconds, and you are going to be in seventh heaven because you'll know so much more. Take a look. NASA works with the Night Sky Network. We're a member of the Night Sky Network, also part of the Solar Ambassadors set up, and they produce this every month. It really is good. It's, it's very short, very succinct, very right to the point, and you can go out there and not feel like something's going over your head. You're not going to be able to figure it out. Well, here we go. 50th anniversary. I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't mention it. So Apollo 11 landing in the moon and the iconic flag and, of course, the only high-definition image with the full-body photograph of Neil Armstrong in it. And you have to take my word, that is Neil Armstrong in the corner there. Um, prior to the Apollo programs, astronauts going to the moon, everyone dresses in a white suit, right? Uh, which one is Neil? Which one is Buzz? They're all in white, right? It's the guy in the white suit, right? So after a certain point, they decided the commander will have the red mark on his leg or his armband. 
so you can differentiate them from. Because there, there's some cases down the road where the two white suits were there, and you <laughs> one of them couldn't remember who, who they were looking at when they weren't facing the camera. So the other thing is, Neil never got a really good high-definition image of himself. Uh, one of the stories I heard, which is the most popular story told to me, is they were in the middle of struggling, putting up the flag. The lunar regulate was a little tough. They couldn't get it in there, so he called to Neil, says, uh, can you come over here and help me? And he struggled and got it up there. He says, okay, now that we got it, let me get a quick picture of you. Buzz gets a snappy salute of the flag, hands it to Buzz to take a snappy salute of him. And then all of a sudden, NASA interrupts by having President Nixon calling long distance from Earth. They had to take the phone call. Only took a little over two minutes. But after that two minutes, NASA was hustling these astronauts to get the, the instruments deployed, to take the soil samples, to take the moon rocks, to get them loaded on. They're only there for two hours and 20 minutes, so they haven't got a lot of leeway there. So they had a hustle. And it wasn't only until 28 days after they returned to Earth, after the quarantine phase. Oops, no picture of Neil. The other one is this one here. Uh, this one was taken by a series of stills from a still camera on board the, the lander. And you can kind of, and it's the only one where Neil puts his visor up because he's in the shadow. So that's the, it's kind of a fuzzy picture, very grainy. It's 16 millimeter stop action film, taking a picture every 30 seconds or so. So he did get a picture, but not a, a really good picture like Buzz. So Alan Bean, I did tell you, took a painting after he retired. And of course he painted what he knows about, astronauts on, in space, right? He says, I feel bad. So here's Neil with the flag racing toward me, right? There's Buzz, the symbol of peace, the olive branch. <laughs> hey, he's an artist, so artists can give him a large view of our planet Earth, which is important to us, right? And uh, he presented this. He said, well, at least Neil will have something this way. And I thought this was cool. And you can see, by the way, everyone notice? Looks like boot prints. Yes, he was told to leave his boot overshoes back on the moon to bring back more lunar samples. Oh, leave your geology pick on the moon. Didn't listen, brought both of them back. And then he basically walked across all his drying paints with his boot overshoe, which he found out a lot of the presentation pieces he got from NASA had the patch of the flag, his name patch, his NASA emblem patch, and his mission patch, and they were loaded with moon dust. So he has taken every single one of them apart, buried them somewhere in here. So you not only, when you buy an Alan Bean painting, you get a picture of what an astronaut views like what it's like being in space, but you get a piece of the moon somewhere buried in there, and you get the feeling from that painting. So I always, I always tell kids, Photographs are great, but there's all kinds of different ways of expressing yourself, and I thought this was awesome. And here's our, basically, Apollo. You can see the 50th anniversary celebrating the first moon landing, and we're going to go back to the moon and the next giant leap to get us on to Mars. And here we go, the Gateway Project here, Lunar Gateway, the Lunar Orbiter Platform. So we're going to basically be sitting on the moon. We're going to be uh, docking with the Orion spacecraft, which you can see here. And then they're going to land, and there's going to be the new style of uh, orbiting, uh, XEMU, basically EVA for Artemis. And hopefully we'll get the first woman to set foot on the lunar soil, and we'll return to the moon. And this is practice, three days away from Earth. If anything goes wrong, hey, you're three days away. You're on Mars, you're three years away, you know? So you want to make sure everything you're going to send to Mars is going to work, and the best place to do it is in a lunar environment. And eh, take a look at that. That's uh, uh, Jack Schmidt. He's the lunar geologist from Apollo 17. And yes, the Apollo astronauts did fall. And if you do notice, there is no external hoses and loose connections on the front of these suits. Everything is internalized. They were cringing, horrified when they found the astronauts tripping and hitting the rocks and taking a tumble. And both of them tumbled in one case. And I, all they needed to do is have a dent in one of those hoses, and they would have been dead. So everything is now internal. The space suits are more flexible, more degrees of freedom of movement, and they're also more protective of the astronauts. So there's our badge, Explore the Moon to Mars. You can see the moon and Mars there off in the distance. 
they finally did put together the four RS-25 engines that launched the giant moon rock rocket here, the SLS, basically, which will bring Artemis to the moon. And it's going to be a circumnavigation of the moon. So we'll go around the moon and return on man first. We've got to make sure it's, it's proven before putting people on board. But we're going ahead with it. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. I know it's cold out there, but I wanted to say thank you by sharing this picture by Ken Cleveland, the Milky Way over Lake Quinsigamond in Worcester. And you can see the beautiful Milky Way with the lit up bridge over the Lake Quinsigamond in downtown Worcester. And I tell you, if the Milky Way looked that good from downtown Worcester, everyone from Alder would be parked on the side of the bridge, oogling all night long, trust me. This is long-term uh, astrophotography and it's called a composite image. Well, there's a story about this one gentleman up in New Hampshire. He's a landscape photographer, and he wanted to generate some action for his business. And he decided, hey, I'm going to take a beautiful picture of the Milky Way. I'm going to post it on my Facebook page. Everyone's going to say, wow, you did such a great job. I want to buy some of your pictures. So he's out there with his friend who he said, hey, I lose a few, you know, winks at night. Come out of here. Share the moment with me. He's out in the field in New Hampshire taking the time, freezing to death. You know, it takes a while to build up hundreds and hundreds of these images, and you got to stack them all together after you go home. But he wants to get the perfect image of the Milky Way. And he's been working really hard. You know, long time, working time, sweet. And all of a sudden, he looks at his friend. They both jump to their feet, and they go, the ground is shaking. What is going on here? Maybe the Western Observatory. Maybe there's, maybe there's like one of those 4.2 earthquakes that no one feels. Maybe we're feeling it here. Oh, my goodness, the ground is shaking. What's going on? Well, not quite. As they say in the business world, you had a rather moving experience. Yes, I'm allowed to say that. But anyway, CBS News, November 10, 2015. Kyle photobombs the Milky Way. Boy, there you go. Unbelievable, huh? So his friend had him posted, and you know, it got posted, and everyone is now wants a ID of the guy who took this picture of the cow in, in, in front of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. Really kind of amazing. So he got a lot of traction on this. So sometimes you got to go with the flow. And he did try to go one side to the other side, was shooing the cows away, and it just could get it. And his friend finally convinced him to post it. I, I think it works. It, it, it makes me laugh every time I see this. And it shows you that not every single moment you take that telescope out, it's going to be prime grade A perfect. You're going to be learning a lot, but have fun with it. And, and be sure to smile when you do it. <laughs> and we do, as, as astrophotographers, our astrophotography group is good. I think we're up to 80 images. This is about 45 images at the Blackstone Library. And you can see we have a wide variety of images. And I see you have a gallery here. So we do go across the state with museums and libraries. And look at the one we just recently went to. This is guests viewing our astrophotography display at an open house on November 1st, which is a Friday. Uh, and uh, this is at the uh, Whitensville Mill in the Spalding, believe it or not, Aldrich Gallery. Everyone was pulling our legs to go, any relationship? No, there's no relationship with Spalding and Aldrich. But it was kind of good to have the name Aldrich up there in lights. And you can kind of see Spalding. Gallery, and here's one of my friends looking at the North American Nebula, and you can see all the beautiful astrophotography. And then we did take people out to observe the night sky because it was clear there, and they were able to observe the moon and Saturn. So we have a lot of fun with this. And that's another way of getting some information out to the public of using Aldrich as a resource. There's a lot of astronomy clubs across the state that could be identified as good resources in schools and stuff like this. This is our local roll-off roof observatory, and every time I talk to a like Home Depot type of person, why would you want to roll off a roof? <laughs> Roofs are supposed to be solid. Not if you want to observe the night sky. So you're protecting yourself from the wind. You've got a support structure here. Roll off that roof by your hands. And then inside, you've got a high-end tracking mount with a high-end telescope with tracking gear uh, downloadable to a camera, which goes to your laptop, and you're able to compensate for the Earth's rotation and take some really marvelous images of the night sky. Really kind of amazing. So thank you once again. John and I really appreciate you coming out tonight. We think you're going to take advantage of the library telescope. And I did get one of my favorite stars to make a, an appearance and saying thank you, in addition to Aldrich members thanking you. Yes, it's our dwarf star, the sun, and he's taking a final bow.
a little finicky, but I got him to do it. And he does a pretty good job of that. And then he always says, anyone got any questions? <laughs> so we have a little fun with this, but thank you again for coming out. Awesome. And please do take advantage if you want. John is more than willing to show you what the red dot looks like in the real telescope there. Uh, I've got a couple play items here uh, that you can look at. Basically, if you want to feel, would you like to come up here? This here is a good experiment. She's going to demonstrate. You're going to hold this. This is three pounds when you're leaving Earth. Now, you want to put that down. Now, she's going into space with three pounds of gear, right? And you want to turn around so everyone can see. Yep. Now this, if she goes to Mars, this is the same three pounds. What do you think? Different? What do you think? Lighter, heavier? Lighter, oh, wait a minute. How about those astronauts leaping in bounds on the moon's surface? You ever see those? Here's why they can leap and bound. This is the moon, three pounds. Yeah, yeah, everyone volunteers to go to the moon first. You ask me, why are we going to the moon first? This is one of the reasons here. Get all the equipment down. Isn't that kind of cool? So, and every, everyone who wants to come up here can try that out. And by the way, you can get a little angular momentum going on your side. If you want to do that, feel free. Take a swing. We do have rocks from outer space. This is called the core of an asteroid. It's a meteorite. It's called Compa de Cielo. Field of Heavens, and that fell in Argentina. And the natives in that area greeted the uh, conquistadors in 1574, and they kept saying, the gods provide, the gods provide, and they led them off to the field. 118 craters with beautiful heavy iron and nickel meteorites in them. And they didn't know the secret of what meteorites were all about. Feel that one, huh? That is what the surface of a rock from space would be like. You ready for this? Hold this. Ready? Boom. Heavy, huh? Very dense. Yeah. Yeah. You got to feel this one here. This is the inside of an asteroid. And we get to learn a little bit about how planets form by finding out what the core of an asteroid would feel like or would look like and then how planets uh, build up over a period of time in the early solar system 4.6 billion years ago. You know, isn't that amazing? These are Awesome. So it's another way of engaging and learning something about outer space and sharing the mysteries of outer space here. And do take a look at the, our primitive viewfinders, uh, viewmasters. They have views of the uh, landing on the moon, and they also have views of uh, different solar system objects. Thank you. <laughs>